lot of surface area to cover. <laughs> Who does that? A few years ago, <laughs> Stacy and I were driving back from picking our son up from soccer with our kids. And I was attracted to this new home community for two reasons. One, they had a lot of really big, bright balloons. And two, there was a large sign at the entrance of this new housing development that said, Free Chipotle. (laughs) I did what any sensible human being would do when I went and got our kids lunch. (laughs) We showed up at the new housing development, and as we parked our vehicle, we were very confident in the way we approached this, that we might someday be new home buyers. And as we walked in, we made the ascent up the brand new beautiful stairs that were outfit with rock and flagstone. We opened the door next to these two brilliant pillars with this bright colored door. And it, it was this unbelievable opening full of lights, windows that were letting in natural light and a chandelier that was hanging down into this entryway, this foyer. Just off to the side were these stairs with the most unbelievable carpet, high quality, soft, plush, bright carpet. The the smell in the house was a, a culmination of Chipotle as it should be and incense that were covering the house, cinnamon and spice. It was unbelievably decorated with an amazing staging that showed the potential for what the house could look like, where the couch and the love seat and the ottoman could go, where the dining room table could go, what the kitchen could look like when you covered the granite countertops with your belongings The fixtures were amazing. One of those touchless sensors that you just waved your hand through, and I probably spent five minutes just playing with it (laughs) because the fixture was fun and the Chipotle was right there. And as we went through the house, we noticed the crown molding, the attention to the details. We noticed the, the shiplap siding on the side of the interior of the house that was painted with a contrast and we ran our finger along the walls feeling the texture of the shiplap and then the metal railings, the iron rod, the cast iron I should say, uh, bars that created the stairway up to the, the four bedrooms upstairs and it was incredible. It was a beautiful home. We went downstairs, we allowed our kids to continue to look around while we got our Chipotle. As our kids came down, we sat around and had dinner in this new living room with random people we had never met before, really good friends by the time we left. And we shared Chipotle and we shared a dream of an ideal of what this house could look like. And then, friends, the individual, the real estate agent the broker who was working for the builder handed us floor prints or floor plans along with the price tag. (laughs) It was an amazing lunch. (laughs) As we walked out, we dreamed about the possibilities of what if someday, and we kind of chuckled at how we were attracted by the big balloons and the Chipotle. But we marveled at how beautiful this home was. It was very well constructed. Do you know the one thing I didn't check out while I was in this home? Not in the basement, not on the main floor, not upstairs. Not one time did I walk around the outside of the house to admire the foundation. We've been to the parade of homes in Oregon. The Better Home and Gardens yards and I don't ever recall doing this tour and walking up before ever stepping foot into the house along the side of the house and kicking the bricks to admire the concrete, to admire the foundation. Hey, mighty nice foundation you poured there. Instead, my attention is always drawn to the beautiful 
craftsmanship of the outside of the house and on the inside of the house. Yet without a solid foundation, there would be no beauty to admire. Sure, on the surface, they would be able to dress it up. They would be able to build it initially and decorate it, make it functional until it had to weather its first storm, until the dirt absorbed the the water, until it began to wash away and then little by little, board by board, sheetrock by sheetrock, paint by paint, it would all begin to fall apart. And I wonder this morning as we are in this series, Beyond the Bells, Life After the Wedding, how many of us, if we're really honest, feel like there have been times in our marriage where we have done little more than paint the dry rot that is the house. If we're honest, you know that your marriage has been built on a faulty foundation, but you haven't really known what to do, and so instead of dealing with the issue of the foundation, you do the, the Band-Aid work of trying to make it look as good as it can, trying to make the most of this mess that you've made. That's exactly what we're going to talk about today, is we're going to be talking about forming a foundation, forming a foundation that is Christ-centric, that is built on the mandates and the requirements of God-honoring individuals. We started this series last week, Beyond the Bells, Life After Marriage, or Life After the Wedding, and we were looking at Marriage Reimagined. The preface of this entire series is that we believe that far too many people spend a large majority of their time, their energy, their investments, and their intentions preparing for the the wedding day, the big celebration. But then sometime after they come back from the honeymoon, the marriage reality begins to set in and little have they been prepared to deal with life's storms in marriage. We talked about the old covenant and the new covenant. How in the new covenant, there's five promises that God makes us in Hebrews chapter eight. The first promise is that we don't have to work to honor the law anymore because God will write the law on our heads and he will place his law on our hearts. He will do the hard work for us. The second promise is a promise of a new relationship with God. That he will be our God and we will be his people. That we will not need to go to a a priest to mediate on our behalf. That we will not have to offer worship sacrifices as a way to encounter the Father or go to the Levites or the, 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 the leading religious individuals of that day. But that through this new covenant we can actually enter into a relationship with God through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus. The third promise of the new covenant is that he's going to give us the Holy Spirit. That we're not alone. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. The fourth and the fifth promise of the new covenant are a promise of forgiveness and pardon. And we talked about the difference between forgiveness. That forgiveness is the act of mercy. Extending mercy when it's not deserved. We paralleled that with the story of the unmerciful servant that went before the king and the king said, I want my $500 and the servant said, I don't have it. Be patient with me. And the king says, you know what? I'm going to forgive your debt. That was forgiveness. That was mercy extended when it was not necessary. But the servant then turned around to be unmerciful for just fractions of what he once owed. Then we talked about pardon. That pardon is choosing to relinquish, to let go, to set aside or to completely forget someone's offense to you, the grievance that you carry. The parallel would be that of the prodigal son. This young man who takes his inheritance before the father is even dead and he goes off and he spoils it. He squanders it on reckless living and he comes back not even fit to be a servant But he says, how many of my father's servants get more in table scraps than I even have? I'm just going to go back and I'm going to beg to even let him, uh, allow my father to let me serve. And he comes back and the father pardons his wrongs. He runs to his son. He meets his son. He embraces his son. He brings out a fattened calf. He dresses him in his robe and he puts on his signet ring or his family ring and they celebrate with a party. The the one brother, the oldest, comes out and he says, "I've, I've always been faithful to you. 
I'm really upset that you're doing this for him. He was reckless, and the father said, look, you have been faithful, and what I have is yours, but this brother of yours was gone, but he's now home. Let's move on. Let's not only forgive, but let's pardon his past so that we can celebrate together. We talked about probably the two things missing most in marriage and that we need to work at to reimagine marriage are the act of forgiveness and the act of pardon. Forgiveness, giving mercy where it's undeserved, and pardon, choosing not to hold any wrong against your spouse or bring it up later. Today we're going to talk about four S's, four foundation S's, four S's in our foundation that we need in order for us to experience life beyond the bells to its fullest the rich and full marriage that God has designed for us. Now, what, what I want to tell you is that this series is not just for married couples. I, I set up the message last week with this statement, and I want to reiterate it. That this series is dealing with God, the characteristics of God, the heart of God. And this series is dealing with people and how we as mankind are to respond to God and to one another. This series addresses and deals with communication and various trials in life. And so whether you're married this morning or not, I promise you that God has got a word for you this morning. If you will open up your heart and ready your mind to encounter God. You've got to let the Holy Spirit do the work that only the Holy Spirit can do. But you've got to come ready to receive. Some of you this morning, you've been married for a long time. And you're looking for a, a facelift in your marriage. Or others of you, you're here in your marriage, if you're being really honest, regardless of what the, the outside looks like, the inside is just devastated. It's in shambles. And you're not sure what to do. You're just, this is your Hail Mary. This is your Doug Flutie Boston College, 11 seconds left. And you're just airing it out, hoping that you can catch that ball in the end zone. Not like the end of the second quarter for Nebraska yesterday. <laughs> Too soon? Some of you are here and you're not married. And that's why you're here. <laughs> you're hoping to find your spouse. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I want to encourage you to grab your Bible and open your Bible to the New Testament book of Ephesians. If you don't have a Bible, let me ask you to raise your hand. I want to invite you to raise your hand and one of our ushers would love to bring you a Bible. This Bible is a gift from our church to you. And so please just hold up your hand and let one of our ushers know that you need a Bible and this is yours to have and to keep. We do want to encourage you to bring it with you each week and follow along, highlight, circle. If you're looking for Ephesians, it's just after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you've got Acts, you've got Romans, you've got First and Second Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Paul wrote this letter to a group of Christians to encourage them and to give them instruction. In a lot of Paul's epistles, he's writing because he's really upset or discouraged or concerned about a, a behavior. In this case, he's writing to this group of new believers, not because he's upset necessarily, but to really to encourage these Christians to figure out how to do life and ministry together. This book is really all about life and ministry together. And we're going to dive in as we study that today. Father, as we move now into the time of the public reading of your scripture, and investigating your will and your ways for us as individuals, in community with others, and specifically today in marriage. I pray that you meet us where we're at. God, I pray that you would deliver us from our brokenness. I pray that you would be the refuge that we so desperately need. I pray that you would be the miracle that we are longing for. I pray that you would be the hope where we have felt hopeless. God, I pray that you would do immeasurably more, so much more, than we came here expecting today. And as I try to preach now, having prepared, I pray that I would decrease so that you would increase and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would please you, God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you later on, if you get an opportunity, go back and read the first five chapters of Ephesians. We're going to be in Ephesians 5 verses 15 through 33. We've got a lot of work to do today. So get your hearts ready, your eyes ready, your minds ready, your pens ready. 
We're going to jump in right before what we're going to read today. Paul has just addressed Christian behavior in community with others. He's dealing with a community in Ephesus that allows all kinds of influence into their community, which shapes their culture. And what he says is, hey guys, listen, as a church, don't do what everybody else is doing. They may be getting drunk on wine, but that's not for you. They, they may be telling coarse jokes and using foul language and really being sexually immoral, kind of living reckless lives to please the flesh. But as Christians, and specifically Christian community, that's not, that's not for you. That's not God's design for you. We're not going to do those things. We're going to be set apart. We're going to live sanctified lives. And, and really, we need one another to do that. We need each other in order to experience the fullness of sanctification, which is the importance of the body of believers. We exist, Country Bible Church, to be a community where people encounter Jesus and their lives are changed forever. And a part of that, we have four values that really drive us as a church, four things that establish the foundation of who we are. We believe that at Country Bible Church, we are all about gathering, growing, giving, and going. And we gather for three reasons. We gather to exalt the name of Jesus through worship and praise and sacrifice. We gather to equip Christians with the public reading of scripture and the presentation of the gospel, the application of the word. But we also gather to encourage one another. Paul says in Romans 1.12, that is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. Church, there is an argument that is prevailing out there right now that you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And while I agree wholeheartedly that you don't need to go to church to know Jesus, you do need to be a part of a Christian community in order to grow in your faith, to grow in encouragement, and to grow as a body. We need one another. We're better together. I look around at many of the faces in our congregation right now, this service, and I'm sure the next. And in large part, who I have been or become the last two years of ministry is because of your influence and investment in my life. It's because you've held me accountable. It's because you've given me your gifts, your time, your treasure, your talents, your words of encouragement. And I hope in kind I have been able to hold you accountable and to encourage you and to love you. Guys, we need each other. In Christian community, we need each other. This is is true from the beginning of time. Genesis 2, 24. We're going to jump into that in a minute, but God created man and a a partner suitable for him. So we're going to jump in today, and we're going to read Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus that was not only given to Ephesus, but was distributed throughout the region, and it was to be read aloud and then explained. And Paul says, in light of everything that I've just shared, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. And when he says, don't live like fools, he's saying, don't live like the culture around you. But I want you to live like those who are wise. Wisdom is adopting someone else's knowledge from gained experience. I want you to live like those who are wise. Don't have to figure it out for yourself, but trust me. Verse 16 says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Church, I've said it so often that life is short and hell is hot. And we've got an opportunity and an obligation to live the gospel. And here Paul is saying, make the most of it. Make the most of every opportunity that you have in these evil days. Verse 17. Don't act thoughtlessly. Don't be impulsive. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. This is a tricky one. A lot of people come to the church. In fact, I would argue most people come into the church, at least from the onset, thinking that church is like an escape room that it's full of clues and it's a big mystery of how to know God and how to live for him, how to receive Jesus and how to be a Christian. But friends, there's nothing about the Christian faith that is like an escape room. God has made his word, his will, and his way perfectly plain and clear to us. He's done it through the act of Jesus and through the presentation of his word, his inerrant word, his word that is complete from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. We understand God's character. And when you understand the character of an individual, you know what they desire. 
what they love, what they long for. The more that we know God, the more we can experience intimacy and community with him. There's, it's not a guessing game. It's not a puzzle that we have to try to somehow collectively put together. It's not a mystery. We're not on an archaeological dig where we have to go with our tools and try to dig in even further to figure it out. God has already made it plain for us. In Colossians, he tells the church, present the word of God as a servant of the Lord. For there are glorious riches when you're faithful. Once the word of God was a, a mystery kept hidden, but now it's been revealed. It's been revealed, church. There is no guesswork. If you want to know how to live for Christ, dive into his word. That is why I implore every one of us every week to come prepared with the Bible in hand. That is why we have given out, I think I just spoke with Pastor Mark uh, this morning. I know I spoke to Pastor Mark this morning. I do know that we just ordered another two cases of Bibles. They come in 24, so we ordered 48 more Bibles, which if I am not mistaken, and I'll have Terry and Mark correct me, means that we have given out somewhere north of 800 Bibles as a church in two years. God's will has been made perfectly clear. We just have to do the work of understanding it. And the only way to understand it is if we get into it, if we dive in together. Don't come here and expect me to spoon feed you and believe that's enough. I am so inadequate. It's the work of the Holy Spirit and the work that we put in to know God that helps us grow. So he says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You want to know what God wants you to do? Ask. Get in his word. Dig around. Find out what other believers are doing who are honoring God. And then he says, verse 18, don't be drunk with wine. It doesn't say don't drink wine, by the way. If anybody wants to know where I stand with alcohol, I personally don't drink, not because I think it's a sin, but because I come from a, a very long line of alcoholics, raging alcoholics, and I have a propensity toward addictions in my own life. And that uh, is, is one reason. The other reason is the time that I have tried alcohol, I, I can't imagine enjoying it. It tastes like diesel fuel. <laughs> so if you say, hey, pastor, what does the church believe about drinking? Well, drinking is not a sin in and of itself. Getting drunk is a sin. Drinking to excess, drinking to alter your state of mind or to bury your emotions, that is sinful because you're relying on liquid substance rather than the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk on wine because it ruins your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled is a present imperative in the original language. Present imperative means that this is an ongoing work, that it's not complete. So we are continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Present imperative, it's a continual work. We don't arrive, the Holy Spirit is constantly working in us to change us, to grow us, to lead us, to love us. This is necessary and this is amazing to know that God's not finished with you yet. How many of you needed to hear that this morning, that God's not finished with you yet? The Holy Spirit is still at work in you. As long as you've got breath in your lungs and you're obedient, God is not done with you yet. Instead, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. This is a juxtaposition of telling dirty jokes and cussing and talking about sex inappropriately in community and culture. This is prevalent in high schools. This is prevalent in workplaces. This is prevalent in circles of friendships where we talk about these things. Paul says, don't do that. He's discouraging us. It's ridiculous. And you sound really ridiculous when you do that. I'm, I'm not casting stones. Paul says it. You know, we told our children growing up that foul language, not only is it wrong, but if, if, if you can't figure out other adjectives to describe your emotions... You should really slow down and think before you speak. We need to honor God. And so instead of, instead of being reckless with our tongue, he says, use your words to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Church, can I tell you that when you have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is continuing to work in your life, it leads to worship naturally. It leads to worship naturally. It should be very natural for us. It should be very instinctual for us to want to celebrate, to want to sing, to, 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 want to, to want to worship. I would really love for our church culturally to adopt this. 
David was so into worship that there was a, a time where he got naked and said, the Bible says that he danced recklessly. And his wife, Michael, reached out the window and said, you look like an idiot. And David said, that may be, but I have no other choice but to worship God. I've got to celebrate. I've got to worship. Because I really culturally would love for us to move toward being a church that is intentional in celebrating worship. To feel the freedom to raise your hands as an act of worship and sacrifice. To say, God, I, I surrender to you. To feel the freedom to clap in worship because you enjoy the music. We don't have music up here that we think you're going to hate. We intentionally work to create an environment where you can encounter Christ and enjoy it. We were never called to bore anybody into the kingdom of God. We truly believe it's the exact opposite, that knowing Jesus is the most exciting thing that you can ever know. So let's act like it. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Then he says in verse 20, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Literally for everything. I love praying at night with my children before I put them to bed, particularly praying with my five-year-old and my three-year-old because they don't know what's appropriate to pray for or not, at least culturally speaking. So they will literally thank God for their fingers. God, thank you that you gave me fingers that could take the chicken nugget from Chick-fil-A because you are the author and perfecter of all things in life, including Chick-fil-A. And the fingers that you gave me allowed me to dip that chicken nugget into the Chick-fil-A sauce, which is a little bit of heaven. And Lord, thank you that you created the play structure at Chick-fil-A that I could go play with and that you have built up enough antibodies in my body so that I don't get every illness that every child has in that place. Father, thank you for my stuffed animals. I thank you for the food that you give us. I thank you for the clothes that we get to wear. I thank you for my bed that I get to sleep in. Lord, I thank you for my sisters. I thank, And they just go on and on and on. And while most parents, when they're tired, and I've been guilty of this, I'm like, thank you, God, amen. <laughs> God gets it, honey. You don't have to tell him everything you've ever been thankful for. He knows your heart. He knows what you believe even before you speak it. I'm finding as I'm growing older, and realizing that this is my last go-round. I cannot convince Stacy to have another child. <laughs> These are the, the final days of my children in infancy. Now, I spread it out enough to where before my kids leave the house, I had better have grandkids in the house. <clears throat> but I love listening to them because they mean what they're saying. They're not just praying this rote prayer. They're praying with authenticity. Jesus says, or excuse me, Paul says of Jesus, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this goes back to what I addressed last week about Jesus being our mediator. That we don't have to pray to a rabbi or a priest. We don't need to pray to any saint, male or female. We don't need to pray to Jesus' mother or any other foreign figure or object. We have Jesus. And how many of you know Jesus is enough? No, I mean it. Jesus is enough. This isn't me just saying what, what I'm supposed to say on Sunday morning. Jesus is enough. Last night was a difficult night for me. In one moment, in a conversation that I was having with someone, I had to say, God, I need you to show up right now. You're enough. And I had to remind this individual who was desperate in despair, you're enough because Jesus is enough. That you don't have to be good enough because God is enough. Jesus is enough. He's our mediator. And we can have an intimate relationship with Jesus. We can know him personally. You know, somebody asked me one time, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you experience a personal relationship with somebody you can't feel, touch, or hold? I'm adopted. I was adopted at age 16. I'm 40. It's 24 years ago. I know my biological father. In recent years, his cousin, Lynette, who does genealogy as both a hobby as well as a vocation, emailed out to everyone, tracing back our family heritage back into like the 1500s. I was incredibly curious to know about my, my father's family. And I learned a lot. 
I learned a lot about, I learned that my grandfather was actually a pastor of an Assembly of God church. I learned that my great-grandfather was half Choctaw Indian, which makes me a 16th, uh, or an 8th, excuse me. I learned that, uh, I mean, I just, I learned all kinds of things. I don't have to, to have touched my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather to take a tremendous interest and to feel a, 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 a connection and to take pride in that relationship. You with me? You know what I'm saying? But not only do we get to take pride in, in the person of Jesus in our relationship, he's given us the Holy Spirit. And so often people will invite the Holy Spirit. And I love that. I was actually talking to someone recently about the Holy Spirit. And they said, why is it that churches pray all the time that the Holy Spirit would come? Because the Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit is with us. And my response was, yes, the Holy Spirit is always with us. And the Holy Spirit is always in us. It's a present imperative. The Holy Spirit is always working in us. But sometimes, even though you know you belong, don't you want to be invited? Even though my wife knows that I'm her husband, don't you think she enjoys it periodically when I ask her out on a date? Not just to expect it. Not, hey, you're going to prom with me because you're my girlfriend. That was good enough back in 1997 when I went to high school. Today, it's bigger than a wedding proposal. <laughs> it's huge. My wife wants to know that she's invited to the table. Don't you? Holy Spirit's with us. He doesn't go anywhere, but he wants to be invited sometimes. So I drive our campus every Sunday morning, and I invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not because he won't show up. But he's already here, but I'm welcoming him. I'm saying, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. How many of you welcome the Holy Spirit in your life and your family? All right, church, here comes the work. Four S's on the foundation. The first one I want to give you is Spirit-led. The key to any godly foundation in marriage is that it's spirit-led. Don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The only way that we're even capable of functioning in life and in a way that honors God is through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The only way that we're ever going to know successful life beyond the bells, life after the wedding, is if there's a centrality in Christ built on the, the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to have this kind of marriage. I'm absolutely incapable of the kind of love that I'm required to give to Stacy. Do you know that? We're going to read here in just a moment that the kind of love a, a husband has to give a wife is a sacrificial kind of love, the kind of love that Jesus gave the church. Do you know what Jesus gave the church? His life. When he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus died because of his Tremendous love for you and for me. And we are called as men, as husbands, to love our, our wives the same way that Jesus loved the church. How many of you are prepared to die that kind of gruesome death for marriage? The answer, short of the Holy Spirit, is none of us. We need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Women, I'm about to use what our culture has deemed a dirty word here in just a moment. Submission. In order for us to submit to our husbands, it's going to require the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes a lot of the Holy Spirit. In order for us to build a foundation that we can create a, a solid marriage on, life beyond the bells, it requires that we are connected, interconnected to the Holy Spirit. We have to have the Holy Spirit leading us, guiding us, directing us, and giving us the authority and the power to do these things. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of love and courage and sound mind. We've got the spirit in us, one of courageous living. And it takes courageous living in marriage. And so the first thing, the first pillar of the four pillars in this foundation is we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Verse 21. And further, this is a hinge verse. He is now going to transition from Christian living, and he's going to give three parallels He's going to give three examples. One is going to be husbands and wives. Then he's going to go on to talk about children's and, or children, children and their parents. And then he's going to talk about slaves and their masters. And then he's going to talk about the importance of the body of armor. So he's giving three distinct examples here. What I want you to know is that most people actually take this entire passage of scripture out of context. Did you know that this actually wasn't written for married couples? Truly. This passage was not 
was, was not created initially for married folk. <clears throat> Marriage is actually just a, a, a living illustration that Paul uses. And then he goes on to talk about children and their parents. And then he goes on to talk about slaves and their masters. That said, everything that he teaches is absolutely biblical and, 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 and from God. But it has, and I'll, I'll explain to you why I even bring that up. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So often the church abuses the authority that they give men over their wives. And they remind wives to submit to their husbands. And it does say that. And we are going to address that head on. But I want you to know that that verb, that statement, that process there is preceded by a mutual submission. And not just su submission in, in, in marriage or children and their parents or slaves and masters. He is writing to who? The body of believers, the Christian community. In other words, we are called to mutually submit to one another. Let's get a working definition of submission so we can do this justice. Submission is willfully setting aside your best laid plans and desires in favor of someone else. Submission is selfless. Our problem is we look at submission and we equate it with being a doormat. That we think submission is, and, and unfortunately that's what's happened is it's been abused. But submission, submission is actually a beautiful picture. Do you know who submitted more than anyone? Jesus. Jesus submitted his will when he washed his disciples' feet. Jesus submitted his will even unto death when he said, Father, I wish that you'd take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. I choose to submit my desires for your purpose and will. We learn submission from the Father through Jesus, and we have the power to submit through the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be able to submit. We're selfish. Wired that way from the beginning. Don't eat the apple, stupid. Oh, this apple? We're selfish by nature. So in order for us to submit, we need the Holy Spirit. So now that we understand submission, and this is really about our, our church, for wives, this means you need to submit to your husbands as to the Lord. You don't submit to an abusive man who verbally abuses you, who physically abuses you, who emotionally abuses you, and who misuses faith to take advantage of you. That's not what you submit to. You submit to a man who is actively following the Lord. Do you see that? Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit, submit to your husbands and everything. The second pillar of our foundation has to be submission. But we need to understand, again, this letter was written to the church, not husbands and wives, but in parallel to husbands and wives. Let's talk about this. The Apostle Paul is dealing with a culture where women, uh, women were, were, were responsible to their fathers and they were responsible to the government and they were responsible to their husbands. In fact, the reason he writes the way he does is slaves were responsible to their masters. Children, specifically male children, were responsible to their fathers until they were of age and accountable to leave on their own. Wives, women, were always accountable and submissive to their fathers, to their husbands, and to society. So the Apostle Paul is saying here, culturally speaking, wives, 2,000 years ago, wives, you've got to submit to your husbands. Yeah, Galatians says that in Christ we're all equal. There's no more male, female. There's no more black or white. There's no more Jew or Gentile. We're all one. But not to the degree in which we overthrow Rome. Culturally, there was a hierarchy in place. And I've tried, ladies, I have tried to wiggle my way out of this. But I need you to know that if you look at the original Greek language here, the word literally means to submit to someone in authority over you. The reason this is difficult is because the men that we're submitting to may not be honoring Christ and may not have your best intentions in mind. But as they are trying to be obedient to the word of God, to the will of God, and to the way of God, it is up to you to submit, to surrender your best laid plans and ideas as they lean into God to lead your family. Does that make sense? The second pillar we need is submission. And it's a mutual submission. 
ladies, there's three verses written about wives and their responsibility to their husband. Guys, there are nine verses written about our responsibility when it comes to our wives. You ready? Good. Verse 25, for husbands, this means love your wives. Agape your wives. Just as Christ agape the church and gave everything. He gave up his life for the for the church, for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did so to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. It is not our job to sanctify our wives. It is our job to lead them into the process of sanctification as we ourselves are being sanctified by the work, will, and way of God in us. We are called to love our wives, to be willing to lay down, to set aside our own lives for our wives. This is the ultimate sacrifice, which is the third pillar of our foundation. First, we need to recognize that we need the Spirit of God. Second, we need to submit. And the third thing that we need so that we don't build our marriage on a faulty foundation is we need to sacrifice men. We have got to sacrifice. We have got to lay it all on the line. You have got to look at your bride like a prized possession. Not that she's your property that you own, but something that you care for, something that you take care of. It's something that you invest in. It's in something you invest your time in, your energy in, your effort in, your emotion in. Your marriage needs to be the most important thing to you outside of your relationship with God, including over your children. Far too many couples end up in my office when their children leave the house. Because they built an entire marriage on a faulty foundation of their children. Their marriages consisted of football games, soccer games, dance recitals, and running their children everywhere. And when the kids leave the house, they don't know what to do. They don't even know who they live with. It's built on a faulty foundation. It looked good for a few years. Guys, like you do your prized possessions, like you do your classic cars, you know that 64, 65, 66 Mustang you've got, the fastback? It's worth about $85,000 because of all the money you put into it, but you'll never get even a fraction of that out of it. You don't want anybody breathing on it. Somebody opens the garage door and you're waxing it. Because you care. Because you've invested a lot into it. That's the kind of sacrifice we are to make to our wives. We are to invest ourselves sacrificially to our wives. Verse 28, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. How many of you have ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Anybody? Five pillars in the pyramid. The first one is physical needs. Then you've got safety. And it goes up from there. Psychological, feeling needed, but intrinsically at the bottom of the foundation of this pyramid are physical needs. Water, Food, warmth, shelter, the important things. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. We are created to take care of ourselves. I've never met anybody who says, my only goal in life is to destroy my body. Now, they may do it by their choices, their reckless living, but nobody sets out to destroy themselves. At least not that I've known. We care for ourselves. We feed ourselves. We get water. We comfort ourselves. We, 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 we do a lot. We are to care for our wives like we care for ourselves. Which leads to the fourth and final pillar, and that is service. In the same way that we service ourselves with the physical needs that we have of food and water and shelter and warmth, we are called to serve our wives. We are called to serve our wives faithfully, intentionally, out of love, not begrudgingly, but because we care for our wives. Verse 31, as scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Genesis 2.24, Paul is using their working knowledge of scripture. He's using the institution of matrimony to help understand, to explain the nature of this relationship. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. That in order to be successful in your marriage, in order to be successful in life beyond the bells, 
You have got to establish your marriage on a firm foundation, not a faulty foundation. You've got to establish your marriage on, 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 on the Holy Spirit. You've got to establish your marriage on submitting to one another out of love and out of reverence for Christ and following his example. You've got to establish your foundation out of sacrifice, of giving of yourself. And you've got to establish a firm foundation on service, of being intentional to look out for the needs of one another. This is a mutual submission. And then he goes on to say, as Christ and the church are one. We are one. If you're wi- Look at me right now, men. If your wives are hurting right now, you're hurting because you're one. You're one. The Bible says a, a wife will leave her mother and father and a, father, a husband in kind will leave his family and they will cleave to one another and the two become one. They become one flesh, which is why intimacy in marriage, which is why consummating your marriage with the gift of sex that God has given us is so important not just physically meeting a need but it, if you think about it you're literally the two flesh becoming one you are tied together it is a soul tie and it is now a physical tie the apostle Paul says all sin is wrong and reckless but if there's a sin that has greater impact in our lives it's sexual sin because it ties us spiritually and it ties us physically to the person that we have just been intimate with that's why God created and instituted marriage between one man, one woman, a husband and a wife to, to care for each other and to love each other, to nurture one another and to be tied together. We are called to be tied together just as Christ is tied to the church. We are one. In North Carolina, my wife and I bought our first house. We paid $80,000 for it. 1909 Cleveland Street, New Bern, North Carolina. We bought it on the good word of an individual in our church and he used his own inspector. We bought the house and we lived there for nearly three years. It was a beautiful house. It was constructed post-World War II and around the 50s where men were coming back from the military and they didn't have work so they created jobs and they began to build these homes. It had thin slat hardwoods, beautiful wood floors, mahogany. It had crown molding. I mean, it was, a, it was a beautiful house. We went to sell the house as we moved away from North Carolina back to Oregon. And as we went to sell the, sell the house, we had an inspection done only to find out that our foundation was faulty. And what they had to do is they had to pull off the siding, the asbestos siding that they couldn't just replace. So they had to pull off the siding. They had to get under the house. They had to dig new footings. They had to pour new concrete. They had to put in reinforced steel beams throughout the entire length of the house, front and back. They had to lift the house up. They had to eliminate the other foundation, the faulty foundation, so that the house would be able to stand the hurricanes that North Carolina gets. So the house would be able to withstand the rain that North Carolina gets. And so the the house was going to be safe and reliable. And so we had to do the hard work. We employed somebody and we had to come up with the money and we had to do the hard work of taking off the lattice and the, the, the foundation, uh, the, the siding of it. We had to strip the facade in order to get to the brokenness inside so that we could reestablish a healthy and firm foundation so that we could, a year later, by the way, this was 2008 when the market crashed, when we paid on the house for an entire year when it was vacant and God was faithful to us. But we were able to sell the house. And the owner coming into the house was able to buy a house with a firm foundation because of the work that we put into it. Some of you are in marriages right now where that's literally what you need to do. You need to strip away the facade. You've been working really hard at putting on band-aids, throwing on some more paint to cover up the brokenness, right? And what you need to do is you need to strip away the facade. You need to pull off the, the siding and you need to dig underneath the house and you need to start digging out new footers based on the Holy Spirit, based on submission, based on sacrifice and based on service. You need to pour new footings and then you need to allow the Holy Spirit to, to lift you up. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to, to raise you up and to put in the foundation that God intended from the beginning of creation. And then as you do that, the house is going to begin to take a little bit of different shape. When they did that, all of a sudden our floors, our floors looked different. The floors weren't actually supposed to slope. Who knew? The walls actually looked different. The house took on new form and new shape. As you dig out 
the broken foundation and you get rid of the old and you build a healthy, firm foundation on the Holy Spirit, on submission, on sacrifice, and on service, your marriage house is going to begin to take new form and new shape. It may take some time. It may take a whole lot of paint after you replace the things in the house that you need to replace, but it is so worth it. It is so worth it. It is so worth it. In order to experience marriage at its best, life beyond the bells, you have got to establish a firm foundation. The Holy Spirit. You've got to establish a firm foundation. Submission. You've got to establish a firm foundation. Sacrifice. And you've got to establish a firm foundation of service. It's not easy. I'll tell you what. It's not easy, but it's necessary. And it's so worth it. It is worth it. It is worth it. When you allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do, he can restore even the worst of foundations and redeem your mess and make it his miracle. Come on, somebody need to hear that today. Listen, we've got a marriage conference coming up near the end of the month. I want you to go. I want you to go. I want you to invest the money. I want you to invest the time and I want you to go to this marriage conference. It's two days. Russ and Ann Countenhoven are coming. They just married off one of their daughters. They have 12 kids. They just married one of their daughters uh, off this last weekend. I called Russ yesterday. I said, hey, how did it go, man? He goes, it was awesome. It was amazing. He's so excited about what they've got planned for us. I want you to go. September 27 and 28. Make it happen, please. I think we only have 27 spots on site and then I think we have another 10 after that and as I understand we were pretty much full last week so please make sure you get registered ASAP I'll tell you what we have enough couples we'll just do a second weekend how about that amen Father I pray this morning that you would restore what the enemy has wrecked and that you would give us the ability to honor your word, to step out in faith and to live out of obedience this life that you called us to live. But I pray that each one of us would intentionally pull back the siding and get underneath the house and allow you to, as David says, search my heart, oh God. Test me and try me. Know my thoughts and my ways. And if there's anything wicked in me, lead me to truth. Lead me to you. I pray that be so in our marriages. Father, help us to do the hard work. I pray for every husband in here this morning and every wife that we would learn all the more what it means to be spirit-led, to submit, to sacrifice, and to serve all for your glory and to the betterment of our better half.